If you kind of look at all the simulated uh, sample proportions that disagreed with the null hypothesis, even more than 0.61 disagrees, that's about, well, 48 plus 48, right, which would be uh, 96 out of 250, which would be uh, 0.384. So you could also, by the way, add the tail proportions. When the computer calculates this, you'll see you'll get these proportions here. It'll automatically calculate it for you. But in a two-tailed test, you actually have to add these together. In the old days, we'd also just take the tail proportion and multiply it by two. So a two-tailed, a p-value from a two-tailed test will always be twice as big as from a, a one-tailed test, a right tail or left tail test. So think of these as all these sample proportions and identifying which ones disagree with the null hypothesis even more than the real sample data did. Right? And that's really what this definition that we're talking about is telling us. So this is sort of how you calculate theoretically how p-values are calculated when you're using randomized simulation. And again, I'll show you some computer uh, uh, in our next video, I'll do some computer work for you, and I'll show you uh, how to how to use the computer to calculate these simulations for you. But this is really the direct way of calculating the p-value. Now, what about the sort of traditional approach? Okay, well, again, uh, before computers were invented, statisticians didn't have the capability of doing this, right? They 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 couldn't just uh, make uh, you know five thousand random samples in, at the drop of a hat. Um, so they had to figure out a way of sort of approximating this, right? So the way they used it is they used the actual test statistic instead. So in the days before computers, you would calculate your test statistic, and then you would use a theoretical di distribution that corresponds to that test statistic to calculate your p-value. So think about it traditionally, you could, you could sort of calculate your approximate p-value based on the probability in the tail corresponding to the test statistic itself. So, um, and again, we used to use calculus for this before computers. You could actually find these, these areas in the curve with calculus. So you think of it this way, if I was dealing with a right-tailed test, I, theoretically I would calculate the test statistic, and then I, maybe it was, a, let's suppose it was a t-test statistic. Then this curve would be a t-curve with the correct degrees of freedom. And then I'd look for the percentage in the tail or the proportion in the tail that corresponds to the test statistic. And that would be my approximate p-value. Um, and surprisingly, it actually gives you pretty similar numbers to what we would get with the randomized simulation. So it does work. Uh, in fact, traditional programs often still use this method. Also, if you're dealing with, even if you are using randomized simulation, if you start getting into a, a 10 population study or something, uh, a lot of times they'll just use the test statistic and the probability in the tail uh, determined by the test statistic. So this idea of the p-value is the probability in the tail or tails uh, corresponding to the test statistic is a good idea to have in your head. So if this was a left tail test, uh, then, then I would look for the test statistic would be sort of where it starts, and then that probability in the tail, this area under the curve to the left of the test statistic, would be the p-value if it was a left tail test. So if this was a z-score curve, right, I'd have my z-score test statistic, and then I'd look for the probability to the left of that. Um, and by the way, you can look up these theoretical, uh, using the theoretical distribution um, function in StatKey, you can actually look up these p-values, and you can kind of uh, see that they're actually the same as what you would get in a printout from a computer uh, software like StatCato. If it was a two-tailed test, it kind of works the same way. You look at, your, if your test statistic is sort of on the far right, put it there. Your test statistic is on the left, put it there. And then again, it will calculate the percentage in the tail, but it will also um, duplicate it on the other side. So you'll get two tails. You'll get a percentage, a proportion from the left tail and the right tail. And you have to add them together to get the p-value. So, um, so I would add these together. And you know, like I say, in the old days, what we would do is just find the percentage in the tail, and then we'd multiply that percentage times 2. And that would be our approximate p-value. Okay, so... Um, nowadays, a lot of times we use this randomized simulation um, in the computer age, and then theoretically, 
Uh, before computers, we, we did a lot of this stuff where we'd use the test statistic itself to calculate the p-value. Now, it's, um, it's really a good idea to have both ideas in your head because you never know which one is going to be used on a problem. Um, but also, let's get into a little bit about how does, how does all this relate together. We have like four key things that we've been looking at. Test statistics, critical values, p-value, and significance levels. Uh, we've already said before that we compare the test statistic to the critical value. And the test statistic would have to fall in the tail to be significant. And then we compare the p-value to the significance level. And we said the p-value would have to be lower than the significance level percentage for us to be significant. And for it to be unlikely to be to sampling, uh, sorry, unlikely to be sampling variability. But how does that fit together? These two graphs I have on the board over here kind of summarize that. So if, if you kind of look at them, it kind of gives you a picture of what's going on. So think about it this way. The critical value, let's suppose I'm just dealing with a right tail test. These are both examples of just a right tail test, though the left tail and two tail works very similarly. The critical value is sort of the where the tail starts, right? We talked about that. And the percentage in the tail, or the proportion in the tail that corresponds to the critical value is the significance level you choose. Remember, we were looking at critical values by putting in the significance level percentage in the tail, and the computer would give us the critical value. Now, how does this work? So the test statistic, let's suppose the test statistic fell in the tail. We said that would indicate that the test statistic significantly disagrees with the null hypothesis. Well, if the test statistic fell in the tail, the percentage in the tail that corresponds to the test statistic, the, this uh, little area right here, would be the p-value. And what you can see is the p-value area, I have it designated in orange, but this smaller area over here is actually a lot smaller than the significance level area. So the main takeaway from this is when the test statistic falls in the tail, determined by the critical value, the p-value will be low, will be lower, smaller than the, than the significance level. Those two always go together. So test statistic in the tail, remember it tells me significance, p-value being lower than the significance level also tells me significance. Those go together. Now what about if the, if the test statistic was not in the tail? So again, this little green area right here is my significance level area. Again, the, where the tail starts is my critical value. Now I'm, now I'm thinking, okay, well what happens if the test statistic did not fall in the tail, right? The test statistic was not significant. The sample data did not significantly disagree with the null hypothesis. Well again, that would mean if I look at the area to the right of the test statistic is now much bigger than the area for the significance level. So this area right here, this orange area, is much bigger now than the green area for the significance level. So the p-value area now is bigger than the significance level. So, the takeaway, when the test statistic does not fall in the tail, right, not significant, the p-value is going to be very big, high p-value. That means not significant. It could just be sampling variability, okay? So these two graphs sort of show how those four things we've been talking about fit together. And a lot of students, especially when they first start, have a hard time getting these two pictures in your head. But this is a good way to kind of think about it. All right? Um, in our next video, we'll look at uh, using computer software to calculate p-values so you can get an idea of, um, you know, using some real software to do this. Uh, this is more of the theory behind it. So I hope it was helpful for you. So this has been a hypothesis test calculating p-value. Uh, so um, this is Matt Show and uh, Intro Stats, and I'll see you next time.